Uh, anyhow, it's great to be here at uh, Hedgehog, and uh, funny enough, I spent the first five years of my life right up the street on Mohawk and Colorado, so it's great to be here right across the street from the Bob Barker building, and the fire station, of course, which I really remember. Plus a lot of fires? No. <laughs> He's not a pyro. Uh, unfortunately, I gotta hold this four pound book to read, so let's see, let's see how it goes. Uh, the name of this piece is called We Got Nothing. It's from the book We Got Power. The attempted assassination of the newly elected president Ronald Reagan kicked things off. It was the spring of 1981, and the Los Angeles hardcore punk scene was in full bloom. The genre uh, was more or less dubbed hardcore by West Coast Canadian punk band DOA. But as far as I could tell, hardcore was really an offshoot of what was happening in Hollywood in the late 1970s, thanks to the blueprint written by Darby Crash, Pat Smear, Lorna Doom, and Don Bowles, the Germs, on their unparalleled GILP. Of course, Orange County's middle class put their out of vogue EP out a year before that. Darby died at the dawning of this era, never knowing what his legacy would be yet. Okay, so Sid beat them to the punch, but both their images were selling an equal amount of t-shirts at the time at the two post-punk record stores on Melrose, Final Fetish and Flip. Mask era punk was fading. Only a few bands survived from the class of 77. A great divide emerged within the scene over punk proprietary rights. Some of the old timers were not exactly thrilled with the second generation of fans of this music, i.e my friends and me. They would scowl at us through their jet black dyed hair and doped up Jane Cool. Where were you two years ago when it mattered? <laughs> you see, at the time, two years was a really long time. All the really cool kids were eternally so much cooler than you because they were there first. Granted, the first wave of LA Punk was filled with incredible and diverse bands like X, The Weirdos, The Zeros, the Bags, the Controllers, the Dickies, the Dills, who had transformed into rank and file at the time, the Avengers from SF and LA, the Alley Cats, the Plugs, the Deadbeats, Black Randy, the Metro Squad, the Screamers, the Go-Go's, who would become the number one band in the nation in 1982. Nonetheless, the fact of the matter was that it was time for a new generation to emerge. This new music was much more aggressive, faster, and the songs were shorter. The bands were younger, less urban, less arty, and less learned musically. The fans were also younger, less urbane, less art school. We were suburban skate kids out to fuck shit up. <laughs> the words of the prophets were written on the bus benches in mag magic marker. Fuck art. Let's <laughs> find out. Faster, louder, shorter. Being hardcore for me meant really being into it. Rather than just to be there for this music that we love, we started to document the scene through photographs, writing, and when, when I could afford it, Super 8 film. I was an avid reader of Flipside, the fun uh, SoCal punk fanzine, and I also seen Slash Magazine on the stands at Rhino Records on Westwood Boulevard. I had sort of wanted to create something similar. The idea festered for a while until a new acquaintance and a local Westside punk enthusiast named Alan Gilbert took the initiative to actually get the ball rolling with We Got Power. Alan and I wholeheartedly agree on music. For example, we both had a fondness for the Electric Eels agitated single. The debut Me Puppet 7-inch, later known as In a Car. Uh, the Red Cross EP on Posh Boy and uh, a half-Japanese sentence that Alan had. In addition to doing some writing and photography, I helped put the first issue together, along with Jordan and Jennifer Schwartz. I'd already known the Schwartz siblings as kids from my neighborhood for a year or two before uh, the LA hardcore punk scene would engulf us. Although he doesn't remember doing so, Alan christened the scene We Got Power after the negative trend song I Got Power, which appeared on the local punk compilation Tooth and Nail, a favorite of ours. Alan soon bowed out as he moved away to attend UC Santa Barbara and fell away from the LA scene. 
Santa Monica High School honor roll student and Keith Richards fan, Kim Pilkington, then became a part of our crew. We were bored teenagers trying to amuse ourselves and spread the word of these bands and the music that we loved. Music uh, that meant something to us. Something that we thought could change the world. We dove head first into documenting and promoting this music in these bands. By now, the scene had shifted from the small and insular Hollyweird to reach the teething masses out in the suburbs of LA, primarily the beaches. Huntington Beach, Hermosa Beach, Long Beach, Oxnard, Santa Monica, Venice, and so on. The bands were Rhino 39, Black Flag, Circle Jerks, Fear, Gun Club, Suburban Lawns, Bad Religion, The Adolescents, The Stains, The Descendants, Saccharin Trust, The Minutemen, Social Distortion, TSOL, Red Cross, Agent Orange, The Last, The Urinals, Angry Samoans, The Mentors, Suicide Tendencies, Secret Hate, Shattered Faith, Channel 3, Aggression, Spelt Incorrectly, The Chiefs, <laughs> Spelt Incorrectly, RF7, White Flag, Wasted Youth, Decroft, SVDB, China White, The Vandals, Youth Brigade, Christian Death, Overkill, Dr. No, The Crowd, Legal Weapon, Mad Society, Sin 34, which was my band, Caustic Cause, Lost Cause, Crankshaft, Red Scare, Civil Six, Modern Warfare, The Crew, No Crisis, The Hated, Hated Principle, Civil Dismay, Social Dismay, Anti, Lunar Defiance, Twisted Roots, Castration Squad, The Disposals, Lieutenant Housing, The Naughty Woman, The Addicts, The Oziers, Toxic Shock, Manson Youth, Youth Gone Mad, The Patriots, Saigon, The Detours, and dozens of other bands that nobody ever heard of, which seemingly existed only on local compilation albums and gigged primarily at house parties. <laughs> Occasionally, West Hollywood nightclubs like the Starwood or the Whiskey and Go Go would still host shows. That is until the Whiskey actually boycotted hardcore punk rock. For the most part, hardcore gigs occurred in faraway suburban and urban spaces like old movie theaters, bars, warehouses. These off-the-map venues were usually in rough neighborhoods, like Bards Apollo in the Crenshaw and Adams District, the Vex, which had three different locations in East Los Angeles, Godzilla's in Sun Valley, the Brown Box in Culver City, Mendiola's Ballroom in Huntington Park, Happy Times Roller Rink in South Central, the T-Board Roller Drum in Pico Rivera, Bob's Place in Watts, Seamus O'Brien's in El Monte's, the Long Shoreman's Hall in Wilmington, the Dancing Waters in San Pedro, the Cuckoo's Nest in Costa Mesa, which was a nice neighborhood, <laughs> the Barn at Alpine Village in Torrance, the Cafe de Grand in Hollywood, and plenty of other one-off dives. We knew very little about publishing, but we learned as we went. We were certainly not in it for the money. We did sell a decent amount of ads, which helped subsidize the publication. The big rewards for us were getting onto the guest lists and receiving free records, which Jordan and I sometimes would fight over. Okay, I get the rap music for Rap People Comp, and you get the Zero Boys Vicious Circle record. By chance, our very first interview was with Pico Rivera's Circle One, a new band, <clears throat> a new band that impressed us with their cassette demo. The band was named after a germ song, although they took great pains to explain otherwise. <laughs> Circle, a group of people bound together by common interests. One, united. At one point during the interview, the tough, muscle-bound singer John Macias mentioned that his father had been a prince one. As fate would have it, John's dad, Mr. Macias, became our printer. Mr. Macias suggested the offset printing, the Tableau ink, the glossy cover, the high quality paper. After receiving our original page for the first issue, he had the insight to recommend the best ways to preserve the zine for years to come, and he did it at a fraction of the normal expense. The quality of the paper was closer to a high school yearbook rather than newsprint or Xerox. Thus, We Got Power was set apart from other fanzines at the time. We Got Power also had a unique sense of humor. 
and it didn't take itself, it didn't take itself too seriously. We focused on the people in the scene almost as much as the bands and the music. We printed the usual gig and record reviews, band interviews, photo collages, scene gossip, all the while keeping our punk tongues planted firmly in our cheeks. Above all, though, we got power was really about the music. For those, for those few in the know, scores of bands were ripping it up almost nightly in the Southland. The magazine brought us into contact with many of these bands, not only locals, but national touring bands. Los Angeles was fortunately a major destination for the handful of hardcore bands that managed to get on the road. The Dead Kennedys came through a lot. Minor threat, a couple times. We were at all the early bad brand shows in LA, at the Anti Club, the Ukrainian Culture Center, and the Whiskey. For, for there were the Encore, Black Flag came out, who were banned for life, and played Rise Above, who was amazing. Meat puppets came through quite a bit, as Phoenix is basically a suburb of LA. Plus, we also saw SSD, DeCroyzen, The Necros, Flipper, Butthole Surfers, Big Boys, The Misfits, and Government Issue. There's that germs influence again. Before long, we had interviewed the cream of the crop of American hardcore, The Misfits, Jody Foster's Army, The Red Cross, spelled R-E-D-C-R-O-S-S prior to their American Red Cross and the Scissor. <laughs> Sacrament Trust, Flipper, Circle Dirks, Day Kennedys, DOA, Black Flag, Minor Threat, Jack Grisham of TSOL, Steve-O of the Vandals, Suicide Tennessee's, Who's Could Do, and the Necros. And we were probably the first publication to feature Henry Rollins on his own outside of Black Flag. <clears throat> My bedroom became the We Got Power corporate headquarters, where I typed and put the zine together. That was the thing about hardcore. It was really about teenagers and their moms, as mostly everyone still lived at home. Now, my mother and Mary's tiny two-bedroom apartment and the neighboring Schwartz condo became pit stops for touring bands. I recall in a Freeland era, Husker Du hanging out. Bob Wolf playing me a rough mixtape of what eventually would become Everything Falls Apart in My Bedroom while my mother asked me to turn the volume down. <laughs> when in town, the day glow abortions, JFA, White Cross would stop by for a visit, as would Maximum Rock and Roll's Tim Yohannan, probably to retrieve my LAC report. We would usually end up at the lifeguard tower on Santa Monica Beach in the middle of the night drinking cases of Lucky Lager beer, which had funny puzzles under the cap bottle caps. Also, I recall back before Sonic Youth could afford to pay for hotel rooms, we Ronaldo and Steve Shelley spending a night or two in my mom's apartment. Henry Rollins once tripped an all-nighter at the Schwartz condo. After coming to the West Coast, the former Washington, D.C. straight edger was spreading his wings and freeing his mind. He started hanging out with Kim Pilkington, who was consuming large amounts of lysergic acid diethylamine. Who wasn't, thanks to Kim? We were in production of our sixth issue, dubbed issue number 666, when We Got Power ceased to exist, sometime in late 83. To the observant, hardcore was over midway through the uh, decade, but for us, the writing was on the wall. In 1984, LA Hardcore seemed to go straight off the edge of a cliff. The cops had shut down all the clubs, and they threatened the ones that remained open to avoid booking so-called punk or hardcore acts. Many bands were evolving in a more crossover metal direction. Everything fell apart. The bands broke up. Friends disappeared. And as soon as we knew it, died away or morphed into something else. We all got into different things, mostly uh, things that seemed to grow from our time in the scene. Uh, I was busy making records and touring, and of course, making films. Jordan went on to work for Chuck Tukowski's Global Booking Network, which handled all the bands at SST at the time. I too became a part of that reality when uh, my second band, Payne Willie, joined the SST roster and traveled across the continental US with Black Flag for six months in 1986. 
And Jordan ended up on the cover of Black Flags and Annihilate this week EP. As the 1980s wore on, many of the bands like Certain One vanished from the landscape. The singer, John Macias, had transformed into a street preacher, <laughs> delivering his sermons on Westwood and Hollywood Boulevard street corners, using the same intimidating macho muscle guy anger that he used to wrap his hardcore punk audiences. The stage was set for his final performance. In late spring of 1991, Macias was shot and killed by the Santa Monica police in front of the mall, in front of the parking structure on Colorado in Maine. Apparently, John had developed some serious psychological and biological, biological issues, and he'd gone off his meds. But the John I knew always had a problem with authority. It was true of many of the other hardcore bands at the time, years before NWA or Ice-T, many of John's lyrics were anti-cop. Already, the LAPD was long known for its rabid anti-punk agenda, hassling anyone who looked punk and raiding and shutting down punk shows umpteen times over. Keep in mind that this was prior to the public exposure of the corruption of police Chief Darrell Gates, famously crooked in that part division. According to witnesses and articles published in the Santa Monica Evening Outlook and the LA Times, Macias' rampage was set in motion <clears throat> by a security guard on the Santa Monica Pier. Apparently, John was interrupted in the middle of a sermon, and that's where the trouble started. John reportedly dropped the security guard over the side of the pier, 25 feet to the parking lot below, fleeing on foot up the pier to Colorado Boulevard, where Macias entered the McDonald's. He approached an elderly, elderly woman, a German tourist who was enjoying a Big Mac. He snatched it out of her hands, punched her in the face, and stopped the burger on the floor. He then fled across the street where he was seen running down the embankment of the 10 freeway. Motorists reported seeing him in the McClure Tunnel, reaching out as if attempting to grab people from their quickly moving vehicles. Somehow, he re-emerged on Colorado, where he was spotted passing by a passing squad car, which called for backup, the Santa Monica Police Department being half a block away. Three squad cars and six unarmed cops surrounded him, guns trained on his upper torso. Unarmed, he charged the six cops, professing aloud, God is going to watch you die, pig. Macias <laughs> was apparently not going to go down without a fight. Reportedly, it took eight bullets to stop his advance. Many bands professed their disdain for the men in blue, but not many of them followed through like John Macias. It was a tragic end for a troubled man. If not for John Macias and his father, We Got Power would have never been the publication that it was.